Hello, I'm Pamela Falk for CBS News. We're here again to speak to Dr. Luis Moreno Ocampo about the work of the International Criminal Court, about updates, about the Sudan, Afghanistan, and the possible U.S. ratification of the Rome Statute and U.S. membership in the International Criminal Court. At least that's possible. Dr. Moreno Campo, it's nice to speak to you again. Can we first start with the Sudan? There was prosecution, there was a, uh, there's a conviction for crimes against humanity but not for genocide. You have said uh, and appealed that, but it still hasn't been determined in terms of genocide against Omar al-Bashir. Can you bring us up to date on that? Each six months, as a prosecutor, I had to brief the Security Council. So I just did it today. And the, the news are, <coughs> we are, there are many problems in many areas, in particular, uh, the Mbeki panel, which is a panel appointed by the African Union, is promoting a very good idea to promote more cases and also the process of, of healing. Also, African Union and the UN mediator, Basole, is progressing. So there is a possibility, there is a possibility to move and stop this conflict. In the justice area, I briefed the Security Council on the progress we are doing in one of our cases. We are prosecuting the rebel leader, Abu Garda, who is, according to our evidence, responsible for attacking the peacekeepers in Haskanita bases. They killed 12 peacekeepers. It's a very serious crime because it affects the entire civilians who are protected by the peacekeepers. Interestingly, Abu Garda did what President Bashir did not. Abu Garda took responsibility and came to the court voluntarily. He appeared voluntarily in court to face charges. He says he, he's innocent. It's okay. I, I, I think he's, he will prove he's guilty. But uh, at least he's going to the court. That's what President Bashir is not doing. President Bashir is refusing to go to court, is uh, refusing to appoint a lawyer to represent his rights, his, his, his defense, uh, and also using political campaign and communication campaign to, to try to protect himself. And the last tactic is trying to, to focus attention in the South, increasing, exacerbating the problem to just shift attention from, from Darfur to the South, and just in order to be protecting himself. And I think it's very important the firm position of the Security Council because I'm willing to, to face the challenge of the court activities in court, but the political situation has to be managed by the Security Council. Now, and you have said that violence has increased in the Sudan generally and in Darfur, but at the same time, uh, and at the same time, I should say, the rest of the other countries in the region are cooperating in terms of potentially arresting al-Bashir if he were to travel there, as happened with Charles Taylor. Do you see progress on that front? It, it's, it's important. In, in the worst problem today in Darfur is the situation in the camps. There are 2.5 million people in, that they were displaced from the houses in camps and the Bashir is providing no assistance for them and is hindering or expelling the humanitarian assistance. That is a crime of extermination according with the chamber. The appeal chamber will rule if also genocide. That, but in the meantime what is happening is important is African leaders are very firm in their decision to support the court decision. So when President Bashir was trying to go to President Suma inauguration he was informed that, okay, we're welcome, but we have to arrest you. Similar in Uganda, similar in Nigeria. So more and more, it's clear it's a fugitive president, and that is the way to arrest head of state. It's a process of marginalization. In this country, when you have a, the allegations against Richard, Richard Nixon, it was a marginalization process first, before he, 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 he could be facing justice. And you said the last time when we spoke that you think he will face justice. But this is his destiny, it's, it's obvious. There is no immunity. Sooner rather than later? I don't know when, but President Milosevic faced justice, Prime Minister of Rwanda faced justice, President Taylor faced justice. Those head of states indicted by the international courts face justice. So that's his destiny. The issue is how we can solve the crime today. It's not just, the problem is, in, instead to stop the crimes, President Bashir is stopping information about the crimes. So trying to deny the crime. That's why for me it's important to put attention on this. The, the crimes are still occurring. We have to stop them. That's the main goal. And the good thing is Security Council was pretty consistent in, in requesting the Sudan to cooperate with the court and supporting 
the efforts to stop the conflict through a mediation. So I hope this succeeds. And that may very well be the next move, is some kind of negotiated settlement. That will be a great achievement for the victims in Darfur, because right now they are still suffering the crime. They are still, each day, women and girls raped, and each day 2.5 million people living in conditions that will exterminate them. So that has to be stopped. It's a, it's a, ma it's a major crime in front of our eyes. Precisely. Uh, moving on to a totally different area of the world, Afghanistan. Mm -hmm. Afghanistan and Kabul signed the Rome Statute in 2003. And as far as uh, it has been reported, you, are, you have begun an, an investigation into possible crimes of, by both Al-Qaeda, by the Taliban, and perhaps torture and perhaps involving U.S. soldiers. Can you speak to that issue? Is there any possibility that you would begin an investigation, even though the United States is not a signator, the fact that Kabul signed the Rome Statute means that any other foreign force within Afghanistan might be subject to an investigation. Can you speak to that issue? Yes. Yeah. One of my duties as prosecutor to select situation to investigate. And it was one of the most controversial issues in Rome. However, that is the law, and in fact, last week, for the first time in my tenure, I request authorization to start an investigation independently in Kenya, into Kenya. Right. So we are doing that. But before I took this decision, I collect information, I assess what happened. That's what, what we are doing in different situations, including Colombia, including Georgia, and including Afghanistan. All of them stay part of the Roma Statute. So that's what we are doing. That means that we'll do an investigation? We don't know. Because, for instance, we conduct a similar kind of analysis for the crimes committed by state parties troops in Iraq. Iraq is not a state party, but the soldiers of state parties working in or fighting in, in Iraq could be prosecuted by us. What we did, we assessed the information about allegations of crime committed by soldiers of national of state parties in, in the Rome Statute. We found in three different situations soldiers who were committing crimes. Uh, but the, in all the cases, the state parties were conducting investigation themselves. And then we say not, we cannot open investigation if they conduct investigation. That does not mean that in all the cases there were convictions. In some of the cases there were acquittals, but after the genuine proceedings. So that we have to but do. The, the, the Rome Statute itself and all international criminal prosecutions are only if a state is unwilling or unable. Is that correct? Uh, only if the, the there are no national, genuine, genuine national investigation. That's why right. as, soon a, as soon a state is conducting their own investigation, we should stop. That's what we do. And at this point, are there any investigations, or do you foresee any investigations in Afghanistan about we torture? We are still collecting allegations. We are still in the very preliminary phase of our examination. So we are not conducting an investigation. We are gathering open source information to try to understand what happened there, to make a decision if, about the next steps. That's and it. does that part of that investigation involve any possible U.S. That's soldiers? The point. We're not doing any investigation. We are, we are not conducting interviews or the with the preliminary parts yeah. that it's you're... It's called a preliminary examination. It's a right. previous phase and we are gathering information. We can, I cannot give you a clear picture of what happened yet. When I'm ready next year, probably we'll give you what information we have. That we are trying to be very predictable and very transparent because if we have information, the best situation will be that the national state conduct their own investigation. Right, and needless to say, because of the U.S. troop surge or punch or whatever President Obama is calling it, with more soldiers in Afghanistan, there's a lot of concern in the United States. Do you for is there any possibility that there would be U.S. soldiers involved in even the preliminary information but gathering? The, but to have a, an American soldier from the SEC, two conditions should be fulfilled. That they commit crimes in the territory of the party, mm -hmm and the military justice system refused to investigate them. So as soon as there is a justice intervention, we should stop. As soon as the U.S. Is, says there will be an investigation, if as you bring it to the As soon as they conduct an investigation, I should not intervene. All right. The next thing is um, U.S. Ambassador Stephen Rapp has 
did testify as an observer, uh, uh, testify as an observer mm -hmm. uh, to the ICC, saying that there were concerns on the U.S. side about the issue of the definition of the crime of aggression in the ICC statute. Is there any possibility that there would be any kind of movement on that if that's the only reason the United States is not, or the principal objection today, that the United States is not a party? But you have to ask the question to the Ambassador Rapp. I, we, I really appreciate that, you, that the Obama administration appoint someone of the caliber of um, Ambassador Rapp. He was a district attorney in this country. Right, exactly. He was a prosecutor in Rwanda tribunal. He was a, the, the prosecutor of Sierra Leone tribunal. So he had a great experience in national and international level. So it's perfect for the job. The discussion on, uh, on, the, discussion on the reform of the Rome Statute to include or not to include aggression crime it's not my activity. I am the prosecutor. I will apply whatever law the state decides to apply. And to. as a prosecutor and international lawyer, do you... I have nothing to say. I, will have, I am the prosecutor. I will apply the law they decide. It's, a, it's not my discussion. All right. Another, another issue you probably don't want to discuss, but from international lawyer to international lawyer, what is your view of the international prosecutions on the 9-11 trial, the international tribunals in Guantanamo? Any no, you are the commentator. I'm, I'm the prosecutor. <laughs> I can make no comment on that. No comment on the uh, trials, either in, in Article Three courts in the United States, as they call them, or in the Guantanamo trials? No, I, I should... I, I, I really That's not an area that no, you would no, deal with. No, it's not my responsibility, so I cannot talk about this. All right, I was just sitting with the, the, one of the justices from the International Criminal Tribunal for Rwanda, who said that basically as they, as these ad hoc tribunals start to wrap up their work, more is going to be in your lap. More is going to be in the International yeah. Criminal Court. It's, it's, Do you it's, see it that way? Absolutely, but the, the, from Nuremberg to Rwanda, we're, we're, it's, it's one phase. Now we're in a different phase. It's a permanent court. So... Look, I spent my last six years organizing my office, recruiting people, training them, defining the standard. It's a huge, complex activity. So the idea to have a permanent court with well-established proceedings and professional people there understanding how to conduct operations is crucially important. So I believe in the future more and more will be dealing in the International Criminal Court. All right. The Hoc Tribunal was an intermediate phase who mm -hmm. now is moving ahead. All right, and moving on to a yet another area of the world, the Middle East, can you give us an update on Gaza and how you view the possibility of considering the fact that they would like to have jurisdiction, even though they're not a nation, per se, on I Gaza think one investigations? One of the interesting things that happened in the last six years is that people from all over the world are looking for justice in The Hague, in the court. And the Palestinian authorities in January came to my office saying they, they like to accept jurisdiction of the jurisdiction of in Palestine for the court. And then it's a, it's a legal debate that we are now having because they are telling me they are providing to me with reports with the legal arguments why they have can give me jurisdiction and we are doing this assessment. Uh, in the meantime what's happening is that there are different people doing different reports of the uh, allegations of crime committed including Richard Goldstone and before that John Dugan in the name of Arab League. And that's something very important because at the, the consensus today is someone had to do a good investigation there. And what would go into your consideration of accepting Palestine's interest in accepting jurisdiction? It's a, accepting it's a legal debate because I received a professor from U.S. in particular sending me reports saying Palestine is not a state, you should reject because that's what the Rome had to say, a state can accept jurisdiction. Exactly, precisely. The Palestinians say the following, they are saying, they are saying it's not about the statehood, it's a controversial issue and you don't need the prosecutor of the ICC discussing that. It's about the, our criminal jurisdiction and the argument is because we have criminal jurisdiction in Palestine, we can provide criminal jurisdiction to you. That's the argument. And I say, okay, interesting, but the Oslo Treaty, who provide the criminal jurisdiction for them, established that they cannot prosecute Israeli people. Mm -hmm. And they are making the legal argument that, okay, but that confirms that we had jurisdiction and we, could do we did an exception for this case. And in normal cases, we can do investigations and then even uh, in some cases, we can arrest Israeli people and then we hand over to Israel. So they are, they are saying they will give me more arguments and they will come with more cases showing me why they can give me jurisdiction. That is the issue for me. 
in I this see, case. Because as an individual, an individual can ask you uh, for an individual prosecution, but they're asking to be for the to, for to accept the jurisdiction on the part of Palestine as if it were to be considered a state party. Yeah, the problem is. Yes, the problem is that, that is can I accept this or not? That is the debate. That will be the debate. Right. Can I accept this or not? So there are there are different legal arguments, and I promise them absolute impartiality and respect for the law. But they are they are trying to give me more information. I will receive the information. Now, would that lead in your mind to other non-states being considered a state part, or at least also accepting jurisdiction? South Ossetia or Abkhazia or the Basque countries or Chechnya know. or anything I else? I, no, I, I cannot be proactive on this. That's they me, could be considered on an no, individual basis. No, no, I, I, I basis. say nothing on this. My point is, what is interesting is the court is becoming more and more the play with the legitimacy right. to conduct investigation when no one can conduct investigation. The biggest demonstration, we had normally demonstration of people, civilians, coming to the court to request justice. The biggest demonstration was from Sri Lanka. Right. I can do nothing in Sri Lanka. Sri Lanka is not a party. However, hundreds of Sri Lankan people came to the court requesting justice for them. So, and I think, I think it's a part of the positive evolution. The court is more and more becoming the symbol that the world needs global justice. Mm -hmm. And that is what is happening. In the same way we have global climate changes, today we have a the Global World Cup, okay, we, have, we need global justice. And the ICC is exactly the model. It's, that's why it's a new solution. It's a 21st century solution mm -hmm. for all problems. No more wars, no more ignoring crimes, facing justice. That is the solution. You can solve the world's problems. No, I, I cannot, but I will for perform my duties as a prosecutor, and this institution is part of the global solution because the interesting part, it's not just the court. The court is a little piece in a big agreement, 110 states accept right. that could be no impunity for these crimes. And that is the solution. And then in Kenya, for instance, that's why for me it's interesting. In Kenya, I went to Kenya to visit the president and prime minister, explaining to them that the crimes committed in Kenya are under my jurisdiction, and my duty to do it. And I'm an independent part of the Kenyan justice system. Right. And that is the beauty of this institution. We are a global coalition to solve problems like Kenya problem. Now, on that front, uh, we, were j we were just here at the United Nations on a Elimination of Violence Against Women conference. There's a men's leadership network. There, the, Rwanda was one of the first, the ICTR was one of the first tribunals that did label rape as an instrument of war. Is the ICC moving in that direction at all? Oh, but in each of my cases, we have, in the, we have uh, rapes and war crimes in the Bemba case. There is a massive campaign of rapes, more rape than right. killings. We have a, in the Joseph Kony case, Lord of the Army case, Co Joseph Kony was abducting girls to transform them in sexual slaves, in their wife, as they call it. And we have a, a rape as a weapon of genocide in the Darfur case. So in each of our cases, we have rapes. Plus, in the Tomas Lubanga case, we show how the girl soldiers had basically three roles be killers, cook, and be sexual slaves. And that's why it's complicated, because, because they consider in the demobilization program, because they were attached to some commanders as wife, they consider they cannot be demobilized. So we are trying to clarify the girl soldiers, even in particular those adopted as sexual slaves, are victims of crime. So we show the gender mm. aspect of the, of the child soldiers' crimes. So, and in particular in the Bemba case also additionally, is a case about command responsibility, will be the first case about command responsibility on rapes. And so gender crimes that's are in the a, middle that's of That's a very way. interesting new development and therefore the, the ICC is developing quite a bit on the human trafficking front, on command responsibility. In many areas, but on gender crime we have the, I had the privilege to have a Catherine Mackinnon is, who is the founder of this theory of gender crime, she's my special gender advisor, so mm -hmm. we are in close contact with her, and we are developing policies and arguments how to, ex how to present well the gender crimes. Basically, gender crimes are crime committed against women, because they are women, or most of the victims are women. Mm -hmm. And this happened in all our cases. And in fact, something I remember, I asked Catherine Mackinnon in Bemba case, we have one case in which a man 
was raped in front of the community. He was mm -hmm. the leader of the community, and he was raped publicly. And I was asking her, what, how do you explain this? It's a rape suffered by a man. And she said, they were trying to humiliate so much, this man, that they treat him as a woman. Huh. And they raped him. So, and, and we're trying to show this particular situation of, of gender crimes in which women are discriminated and the center, the target of these type of crimes. All right, you've covered a lot of the world in this discussion and in the court itself. Tell me, just wrapping up, what is uh, the basic thesis and, and premise of the report that you just presented today to the Security Council? I say to them, I'm ready to face any challenge in court, but to control the political campaign of President Bashir saying they, had, they are increasing the tension in the South to shift attention to pretend that he had to be, in his responsibility had to be ignored in order to save the South. I cannot deal with this. Mm -hmm. I request Security Council support. And I think it's very interesting because it's, it's forthcoming. Security Council members were pretty clear in the need to integrate justice and peace. That was supported by UK, by US, by China, Russia, everyone. And you don't in foresee any veto on that issue? No, no, no. Any but including problem. Libya, who was the most critical, they basically criticize because they say it's unfair because it's double standard. What happened in, that in Darfur happened in other areas and states, he was in the US basically. US is supporting Darfur and is ignoring the, what happened in crimes committee in other parts. So basically even Libya is supporting the idea justice had to be done. So in this sense, in not just I received support for the arrest of President Bashir, I feel the idea of justice now mainstreaming in the UN Security Council. Well, thank you very much. You've covered the world. Thank you very I would much. like to thank you very much for coming back. And for CBS News, I'm Pamela Falk here with Dr. Luis Moreno Ocampo.